Hello and good morning. Today is Wednesday, February 15th, 2023, and I am your host, Kenny Polcari. And so what is it that we need to know? Well, CPI, it was both hot and cool, right? Causing a little bit of confusion. And the Fed heads are repeating the narrative. There is more work to do, right? Now, they come up with a CPI super core number. Really? Five plus five equals three now. It's unbelievable. Retail sales due out at 8.30 this morning. We're going to find out, is the consumer broke yet or not? Gold and oil take a step back as the dollar rises. And what do we have for dinner tonight? We're going to have the Italian baked chicken pizzas with potatoes. It is delicious and simple to make. Okay, look. The consumer price index is both, or was both, hot and cool, which makes it interesting, right? The year-over-year -year read was hotter than the expectation, coming in at 6.4 versus the expectation at 6.2, but it was cooler than last month at 6.5. The month-over-month -month number was right on target, which was hotter than last month, up five-tenths of a percent. And what makes this interesting is that the year-over-year -year numbers were supposed to be weaker, and they were not. And all this does is suggest that inflation may be more entrenched than not. And as a result, uh, may not be going away anytime soon. Uh, futures, which were higher in the pre-market, turned sour prior to the opening as investors and traders tried to decipher what it all meant. Then the algo sent stocks on a roller coaster right up then down and down more. And then by the end of the day, it left the, down, the Dow down but up off its lows by 157 points or down five tenths of a percent. The S&P was off just one point. The NASDAQ was up 69 points. Uh, the Russell down one and the transports gained 170 points or better than 1%. Comments by different Fed members also added to the confusion. Richmond Fed President Tommy Barkin told Bloomberg that if inflation persists at levels well above our target, maybe we'll have to do more. Well, guess what? It is at levels well above their target. New York's Johnny, uh, New York Fed President Johnny Williams said the battle isn't over yet. While Dallas Fed President Lori Logan said, we must remain prepared to continue rate increases for a longer period than previously anticipated if such a path is necessary to respond to changes in the economic outlook or to offset any undesired easing of conditions. Guess what? Conditions are undesired at the moment, right? And then Philly's Patty Harker comes out and said this. He thinks policymakers are nearing the point where rates are restrictive enough. Saying, in my view, we're not done yet, but we are likely close. And all that did, that's all the algos needed to hear, right? The statement sounds like the Fed is about to pause and then pivot, or at least that's what it sounded like to some of the traders in the algos because likely close to the finish leaves the door wide open to interpretation. And it's not an outright hawkish tone the way Williams and Barkins and Logans was, right? And all that means is maybe there's a slight crack in the foundation. Now I'm not in that camp, right? I don't see a crack at all. I just think that people hear what they want to hear versus what's being said. And so it goes. Now look, the other reason for optimism yesterday was the latest CPI component that we never, ever heard of, right? But we will now because they need to find a positive in this otherwise negative report. Ready? Are you ready? It's called the super core figure. Something I have never heard of before yesterday. And I've been doing this for 42 years and I never heard of anyone speak of a super core component. But okay, let's run with it because they brought it up. So let's run with it. Unlike core inflation, super core inflation does not have a specific definition. It is a term that expresses price measures that excludes sectors that economists feel distort the broader inflation picture. So apparently the super core figure is CPI X food and energy, right? Which is core minus housing. And when you strip all that out, the super core rate rose by only three tenths of a percent. Well, of course it did. You eliminated parts of the equation. So, it, for example, it's like saying something like this. You have four components. You have food at four, energy is three, housing is three, uh, and services is five. That equals 15. 
But if you want super core, you eliminate food, energy, and housing, and that leaves you with just five. So the answer goes from 15 to five. It's like magic. Why don't you just take everything out? The CPI will be zero. That's good, no? Yeah, it is until you go to the supermarket or you try to pay your electric bill or you try to fill up your car with gas. Then suddenly, it's not zero. Okay, whatever. But you get the point, right? Let me also remind you that on the economic calendar that you can find on Bloomberg and a bunch of other places, they only have CPI and CPI X food and energy. They don't have a, a section called CPI super core figure. Never. It doesn't exist. Which leads me to ask, how come we never heard of the super core figure before? Again, it's a rhetorical question. There's no need to answer it, but you should think about the answer to the question. Now, all this means is that the data suggests to me and to others that the Fed is going to raise rates by 25 basis points in March, again in May, and then in June, before they even consider pausing. Recall that the surge in stocks was born on the hope that the Fed would pause in March and then pivot sometime over the summer. So the pause decision cannot now be made until you get the April and May macro data to see how strong or weak it is. And the idea of a Fed pivot, right, cutting rates, yeah, that's not happening in 2023 at all. So then you got to ask, what will stocks do now? Will they take it all back? Will they just churn in a tight range? Or will they just ignore it and continue to push higher? In the end, the fact that both month over month and year over year rates are up will keep the pressure on the Fed uh, if their goal is really to tamp down inflation. Now, today brings us retail sales data, and the estimates are strong. Month over month, up 2% two two versus last month's negative 1.1. A 3% swing. X autos and gas of up 9 tenths versus last month's down 1.1. Again, it's a 2 percentage point swing. And then you get the Empire State Manufacturing, expected to be minus 18, up from minus 32. Industrial production of up a half a percent, up a five tenths of a percent versus last month's a down seven tenths and capacity utilization of 79.1 percent. The CPI data yesterday sent the treasury market tumbling, causing yields to rise. Remember that when investors are worried that bond yields won't keep up with rising inflation, demand for them dries up, the bids move lower, prices fall and yields go up. And that's what we saw happen yesterday. The bond market is telling you that inflation isn't transitory. The three-month T-bill is now yielding 4.6%. The six-month is yielding 48 And the two-year yield jumped to 46 up from 4.5. Oil moved a bit lower, falling 90 cents to 78.20. The American Petroleum Institute reported that U.S. crude stockpiles rose by more than 10.5 million barrels causing Stevie Brennick, who's an oil trader at PPM, to tell us that we're swimming in oil. There's so much oil. The, uh, uh, the Energy Information Administration is due to report their data today. The CPI data and the comments by a slew of the Fed officials is just a subplot, spurring worries that higher rates for longer is going to send the economy into a deeper recession, causing demand destruction. I'm shocked that they left the whole China reopening out of the conversation yesterday, but they'll save that for another day when they need that argument, right? This morning, uh, we find trend line support at 77.40, so we're above that. The dollar index, which had traded down to 101 last week, found support is now trading back at 103.55, up 32 cents today. And that makes sense if you think rates are going higher from what the expectation was. Recall that the fall in the dollar from October from the October highs was all about the Fed navigating a soft landing and controlling inflation. The recent move up is starting to suggest something a bit different. We're just above the trend line at 103.33 and holding tightly to that trend line. Let's see what happens after we get the PPI tomorrow, right? The producer price index. Gold down $20 this morning. It was down, it's down 130 cents. The early February high as investors reconsider the pace of inflation and what the Fed's next move will be. Yesterday's CPI data only emboldens the Fed to push rates up. And here's how they said it to try to spin the positive, right? Inflation rose at its slowest pace since 2021. So you see that rose is negative, but slowest is trying to be positive, right? So they're trying to spin a positive. Yet they're continuing to push rates up and that's going to cause gold to retreat a little bit, right? Gold is now between solidly between the trend lines, 1,800 support and 1,875 resistance. U.S. futures this morning are down 
as investors, traders, and algos continue to digest the latest data, right? Dow futures down 70, S&P's off 20, the NASDAQ down 50, while the Russell's down 10. On Thursday, tomorrow, we're going to get the uh, inflation at the producer level, and that too is expected to show a larger increase in the month-over-month -month number, uh, while still showing a decline in the year-over-year -year number, at least that's what the expectation is, because that's what it was for CPI yesterday, and that didn't happen. After yesterday, what does that potentially mean for the year-over-year -year number for PPI? That's the question. Will it mimic the CPI? And if we see an increase at the producer level, remember, it's just a matter of weeks before you see those price increases at the producer level filter themselves down to the consumer level. European markets are mixed this morning. UK CPI fell for the third month, but it is still running at 10.1%, right? Below the expected 10.3%. But think about that. Inflation is running at 10% in the UK. The UK and Italy are a bit lower, while France, Germany, and the Eurostock indexes are all up by about a half a percent. The S&P closed yesterday at 41.36, just down one point. And what looks like nothing really happened. But we did see the S&P swing in a 60-point range yesterday from a low of 4,095 to a high of 4,159 before the bell rang. We pierced the 4,100 century mark on the way down, but it retook it as investors remain resilient and unfazed by the higher CPI read, or at least they were yesterday. Again, we remain in the broader 4,4200 trading range. And the more we reign up, remain above 4,100, then the more significant the 4,000 range becomes support. I think we are going to test it, uh, 4,000, and I think 4,200 will remain a headwind for stocks just until we get through this and we digest and figure out what the Fed's narrative is going to be ultimately, right? Uh, the jury is still out on whether the landing is going to be hard, soft, or just long. I continue to think that we're going to test the 4,000 level in the next couple of weeks, and I think it holds. As a long-term investor, I'm happy to let the names come to me. We talked about that. I'd rather, uh, I'd rather than chase the names. I don't chase the names, right? I continue to favor, you know, the stuff that people need, and I'm kind of complementing that with uh, exposure to aerospace and defense, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, and then the SMIDs, right, the small and the mid-caps. Remember, building the strong foundation is the key. Dollar cost averaging is the key. Time in the market is better than trying to time the market. Buy names on weakness as long as the weakness is not a fundamental shift uh, in the sector or the name. I'm always happy to talk about it. Feel free to reach out. Okay, what do we have for dinner tonight? Italian baked chicken parts. Mm, legs and thighs. Delicious, right? So you need the legs and thighs with skin on, washed and padded dry. You need potatoes, you're going to cut into pieces. You need six to eight, maybe ten cloves of garlic all chopped. You need one large white, uh, one large yellow onion diced. You need parsley, you're going to mince it. You need parmigiano, reggiano cheese, fresh grated. You need dried oregano, olive oil, uh, kosher salt, and black pepper. Uh, you want to preheat your oven to 375 degrees and set the oven rack right in the middle section, right? And then get that ready for you. Now, cut the potatoes up into approximately, you know, one-inch cubes uh, and then rinse them and then just pat them dry with a paper towel and set them aside. Now, in a large bowl, you're going to combine the diced onion, the garlic, the parsley, the oregano, the grated cheese, and about a half a cup or maybe three-quarters of a cup of olive oil. Mix, <clears throat> mix it well. Season your chicken on both sides with the salt and pepper, and then add the chicken to this bowl, coating it well, using your hands to massage the chicken pieces. Now, layer the chicken into a large baking dish, skin side up, uh, large enough that's going to accommodate also the potatoes, right? Toss now the potatoes in the bowl that's got, uh, you know, all the mixture in it. Roll the potatoes all in the mixture. Again, you can use your hands to get that done, and then place the potatoes all around the chicken. Drizzle a little bit of olive oil over the whole thing and push it in the oven and let it bake for 45 minutes. At about 20 minutes, you want to take it out and you want to just baste the chicken and baste the potatoes with some of the juice that it's creating. When it's done, you can broil the chicken and the potatoes just for a few minutes to crisp it up, but be careful. You don't want to burn it. So if you're going to do that, just stand there and watch it to make sure you don't screw it up. When the chicken is done, when it comes out, sprinkle it just with a little bit more of kosher salt, right? And then cover, cover it with a, a foil tent and let it just sit for, you know, 5 to 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes before serving. The chicken is going to reabsorb some of the pan juices and become a little bit moister. But it's dark meat anyway, and it's really delicious. And right before serving it, you want to toss the chicken and the potatoes in the pan juices. 
and then serve. Now you can set this on, uh, like you do like a, a family style, set it up just on a big tray, put it in the center of the table, or if you want, you can just make individual dishes and you know, you would, you would serve this just with a, a big side salad, right? A mixed green salad. You don't need any other vegetables. You got the potatoes, you got the green salad. You'll be fine with that. Uh, and you can have your favorite. Uh, I would I would drink uh, you know a white wine with this, but you could drink a white or you could drink you know a light red. In any event, it's a great dish. It's easy to make, but you can come home, whip it all together. It takes you forty five minutes. You can set the table, get changed, take a shower if you have to, and bang, it's all done. In any event, it's another beautiful day here in South Florida. You can look out the window and just see that. But until tomorrow, take good care.